The Ultimate Disguise I'm not sure if this is the right place to be posting this, but I don't know where else to go for help. I know that after I describe the events that just happened, the ones involved may come looking for me. I have decided it's worth the risk though. I'm still pretty shaken up, but I'm going to do my best to recall everything exactly as it happened. If something similar has happened to you or anyone you know, and you could advise me what to do next, I would really appreciate it. It might actually save my life. Last night wasn't the first time I had been woken up by a sound coming from the wall behind my bed. It sounded like something large and heavy sliding along the other side of the wall. It was especially odd, because I didn't think there was anything on the other side of that wall. I thought I had heard it several nights before this one, but was never certain if I had dreamt it or not. This time though, I knew I was awake. I was lying in bed next to my husband, Jason. I had my eyes closed, while trying to fall asleep. I couldn't stop thinking about the fight Jason and I had a couple hours before. He told me in the five years we had been married, he had never seen me like this, a complete shell of the person I once was. He told me that I had let my paranoia completely consume me. I could tell he was deeply concerned, but also frustrated with my lack of effort to dispel it. I knew that even if I was honest about what I was worrying about though, he would not understand. I slowly sat up in bed, straining to listen for another sound. Maybe it was some kind of animal? It sounded much too large to be a raccoon though, and bears are not common in our area. As I slowly leaned in closer to the wall, my heart jolted as I heard a very loud, thump thump. It sounded like a deliberate pounding on the other side of the wall, almost as if it was trying to get my attention. In a low whisper, I immediately called out to Jason as he slept next to me. How could he have slept through that? He didn't even stir, so I called his name again and tried touching his shoulder. He continued to sleep like a baby. I was about to call his name one more time when I remembered that my paranoia was the main reason for our fight earlier. Would he even believe me? I sat in the dark for a few more minutes before deciding to get up and investigate myself. As I made my way downstairs, I caught a glimpse of a photo of the two of us from our honeymoon. Although it was from only five years ago, Jason and I looked so much younger. It was probably due to the fact that we were smiling so big. I have been trying so hard to be that happy girl in the photo for him and for me, but recently, I haven't even come close. I decided to start my investigation of the mysterious sound with the garage, since it is located directly under our bedroom. I flipped the light on and scanned the room from wall to wall, looking for anything out of the ordinary. Everything looked the way it was supposed to. Our car was parked out on the street that night, so the garage was just a large, echoed room. Gardening tools, storage containers, Cleaning supplies and various pieces of sporting equipment packed the shelves along the far wall. There was also a small stockpile of food and water Jason liked to keep just in case of a disaster. Remember, being paranoid is my thing though. I made my way over to the shelves to see if anything could have made a noise like the one I heard. As I was halfway across the garage, I heard a loud slam come from above me. My eyes darted up to the attic door in the ceiling and the pull string that dangled from it. The string was slowly swaying from left to right. Great. That's normal, right? I never realized that our bedroom shared a wall with the attic until now. I thought hard about running upstairs to get Jason's help. That would be the most logical thing to do, but just as I was about to do that, I had this feeling. I had a very faint idea of what could be the source of the disturbance, but knew that it would defy logic. I also knew that based on the five weeks we had been together, if there was even the slightest chance that my suspicion was correct about the source of the noise, Jason would not understand, nor would he even be willing to help me deal with it. If I was going to be able to protect the both of us, I knew I had to deal with this myself. I walked over to the attic door and grabbed the pull string. With a loud C-R-A-A-A-A-K the door slowly swung down. I grabbed the ladder attached to the door and unfolded it down to the ground. I directed my attention back up to the ceiling, 
and stared into the black hole that was the attic entrance. My eyes strained to make out anything inside, while I waited for something, anything to come out of the darkness. I turned to the shelf next to me and grabbed a flashlight. After pointing it toward the black hole in the ceiling, I still couldn't make out anything, so I contemplated my options. Less thinking, just do, Mel. I knew that if I waited any longer, my thoughts would scare me into complete paralysis, so I began to climb. With each step, the ladder let out a painful creak. This ladder was as old as the house, and I have no idea if it was ever inspected. The way it would bend under my very minimal body weight made me realize the very real possibility that it could give out at any time. We really need to have this thing inspected. The black hole grew bigger and bigger with each step. I held my breath the whole time, ready for either the ladder to crumble beneath me or something to emerge from the darkness. Thankfully, neither of those things happened. Once my head breached the attic opening, I remembered to breathe, and drew in a large breath of stale, musty air. I scanned the attic with my flashlight. It wasn't really a room, more just a storage space between the ceiling of the garage and the roof of the house. The ceiling formed a triangle with the highest point being only five feet tall. As I slowly panned my flashlight across the space, its beam revealed various objects in storage, an old dollhouse, a large shop vacuum, a full-sized scarecrow, a snow shovel, a vintage suitcase, a pair of kayak paddles, several boxes, and lots of Christmas and Halloween decorations. The holiday decorations appeared pretty unsettling in the beam of the flashlight, probably because a lot of them had faces that were looking back at me. The witch especially gave me the creeps with her pale, green skin, hands covered in warts, and open mouth full of yellow teeth. Oh and don't forget the random Christmas elf's detached head just resting on top of a box with its single, beady eye reflecting back at me. Why does it only have one eye? Why is its head not with its body? Why do we even have this thing? After doing a full scan of the space with my flashlight, I reached behind me to turn on the attic light. The second the light turned on, I jumped as I heard the sound of movement coming from the pile of junk in front of me. I held my breath and stared long and hard, while looking for any sign of movement. That which better not move, I swear. After a long minute of waiting, nothing had moved in the slightest. Just as I was letting out my long-awaited exhale, a loud, whack whack bwak, erupted from my right side. I whipped my head around to reveal a plush toy of a chicken lying on the floor on its side. Bwak, its electronic voice box cried out again. I looked around, wondering what could have caused it to go off. The floorboards beneath me creaked as I crawled my way over to the plush chicken and picked it up. I stared into its black, soulless eyes. There was something about this chicken. It felt too personal for some reason, almost like it was a taunt. Then, I heard the sound of movement coming from the pile of junk again. I looked back and could have sworn one of the objects had moved. Was it the witch? The scarecrow? I couldn't tell for sure. I waited several seconds before directing my attention back to the chicken. That's when I noticed something behind it. About four feet up from the floor, there was a very small hole in the wall about the size of a pea. I put my eye up to it, and my stomach lurched. Through the hole, I could see right into my bedroom. I couldn't see the bed so well, but I could make out pretty much anything at eye level. Whoever or whatever was in the attic could have been watching us this whole time. From inside the bedroom, the hole was positioned just under one of the framed pictures hanging on the wall. The shadow from the frame must have concealed it all this time. I could feel my heart rate begin to drastically accelerate. I turned back to the pile of junk, since whoever or whatever was in the attic with me must be hiding somewhere in that pile. That's when I noticed what had changed. Earlier, the scarecrow was sitting upright with its back against a box, but now it was slumped over with one hand extended out toward me. And was it closer? I stared at it still, faceless head hidden in shadow beneath the brim of a wide, black farmer's hat. I looked for any sign of life in its body, 
which wore a red flannel shirt covered in hay and stained khaki pants with patches on the knees. I began to hyperventilate. Come on, Mel. If you have a panic attack now, you are done for. I slowly backed away from the scarecrow until I heard a loud crunch under my feet. I looked down and saw that I had stepped on an empty plastic water bottle. I gasped in horror as I noticed several other empty water bottles along with empty food cans and a pile of blankets resembling a makeshift bed. Someone was living in our attic. Before I could react, I heard fast stomping coming right toward me. I looked up and saw the scarecrow lunging for me. I fell onto my back with my eyes closed, and braced for the inevitable. I heard the sound of movement, the creaking of the ladder, and then all was silent. My eyes slowly opened. The scarecrow had vanished. I crawled over to the attic entrance in the floor. The garage light below had now been switched off, so the way down was nothing but a black void. I grabbed the flashlight and pointed it down into the garage. I let out a gasp as I saw the scarecrow standing directly at the bottom of the ladder facing up at me. I wanted to scream, but nothing was coming out. It stood there perfectly still, almost too still for a person to be inside of it. Was this a person? I waited and waited until, it charged at the ladder, making its way toward me. I frantically dove toward the pile of junk and grabbed a paddle to defend myself. When I turned back to the ladder, the scarecrow was gone. There was only the rickety ladder and the black void below me. I gave myself a few seconds to catch my breath. If I was in fact dealing with what I suspected I was dealing with, I had a right to be scared out of my mind. I also knew that I couldn't let it get to Jason first. Whatever this thing was, I had to stop it. After taking a deep breath, I made my way down the ladder. I held my flashlight in one hand and the paddle in the other. I made sure to alternate the flashlight between the steps below me and the rest of the garage. If the scarecrow was able to knock me off the ladder, I would be done for. When my feet finally touched the concrete floor, I wanted to let out a sigh of relief, but I knew the fight was still ahead of me, or maybe behind me. It was so dark, the scarecrow really could have been anywhere. If I could just make it to the door to the house, I knew I could flip on the light, spot the scarecrow, and charge it with everything I had. I walked as fast as I could toward the door, whipping my flashlight in all directions. I only got halfway through the garage when I heard a loud squeaking noise to my left. I knew I wasn't getting the chance to make it to the light switch. I slowly turned my flashlight to reveal the scarecrow slumped over and sitting on an old, red radio flyer wagon. This was it. I knew that the element of surprise was all I had. I charged at it with everything inside of me. I swung the paddle again and again with all of my strength. I wouldn't let this thing ruin the life I had worked so hard to obtain. I didn't stop swinging until the scarecrow was completely face down on the ground. My rage turned to fear as I slowly sensed something was off. I realized the scarecrow's torso had become completely separated from its legs during the beating. My heart nearly stopped when I finally realized that there was nothing inside of the scarecrow but hay. I poked its body a few times before I noticed a trail of straw leading away from it. Wherever this trail led to, I knew it wasn't going to be good. As I followed the trail of hay with my flashlight in one hand, I shakily held my paddle in the other, ready to strike again. The trail curled away from me until it ended at a pair of bare human feet. I let out a quiet scream as I tilted my flashlight up as fast as I could and, wham. I could barely make out the image of a metal baseball bat whirling toward my head before everything went black. I woke up only a few seconds later on the garage floor with my head throbbing in pain. My vision was fuzzy, but I could see there was a shape standing in front of me. It was backlit by the light of my flashlight, which had rolled away from me. It took a few seconds for my eyes to focus on the pair of bare, dirty feet in front of me, covered in hay. As I slowly tilted my head up, I could see those feet were attached to a pair of legs wearing tattered pants. Those legs were attached to a body with two arms, 
one holding a metal baseball bat. The body was attached to a head, and on that head, was a face. It was exactly the face I feared I would see. It was the face of a woman with the exact same face as me, the face of Melody Bennett. No, I gasped. How did? Melody stared at me with rage in her eyes. Pieces of hay covered her hair. I turned my head to the side and looked at the scarecrow's lifeless, empty body next to me. Then, I turned and looked at Melody's hay-covered feet. I have to admit it now. Wearing the scarecrow as a disguise was a brilliant strategy. She really took a page from my book of deception and used it against me. Your life was mine, I began to cry with eyes full of fear. I took it from you. I'm taking it back, she declared and raised her bat high. I tried to let out a scream, but it was too late. She was already on top of me. Wailing on me with the speed and aggression of a wild animal. She struck my head with the baseball bat again and again. With each blow, I could feel my face start to change out of the face of Melody and back into its natural form. First, my mouth morphed away, followed by my nose, and then my ears. Just as she was about to swing what would have been the killing blow, I threw my hand up and grabbed the bat. Both of us were now struggling for control of the bat. That's when I could see my true face reflected in Melody's eyes. My two eyes were wide and bulging, completely filled with terror. My other features were completely gone. Smooth skin was now in their place. I looked into Melody's eyes as we struggled with the bat. This was a woman that would stop at nothing to take back her life and be rid of me. I wasn't going to win this fight. I had to escape. My fear somehow gave me enough adrenaline to throw her off of me. I knew I only had a second before she would be on top of me again, so I booked it out of the house as fast as I could. I didn't stop running until I was across the street hidden in the shadows of a neighbor's tree. I turned back to see Melody standing in front of her house blocking any hope I had of going back there to her beautiful, lovely life, a life, which she had taken for granted until now. She had the last five weeks to think about it as she was living in the attic. All that time, she watched helplessly behind the wall of her own bedroom as I, an imposter wearing her face tried my best to pass as her. She had all that time to watch me, study my weaknesses, and devise a plan to take her life back. From across the street, I watched as she took in one last big breath, smelling the fresh air and appreciating the world she had once taken for granted. She slowly exhaled before walking confidently back into her house and locking me out for good. I can't tell you how frustrated I am that this one didn't work out for me. I thought for sure that I had killed Melody before I had replaced her. I thought for sure that I was going to get to live in her place forever. I won't make the same mistake again. Next time, I will make sure the person I am replacing is actually dead. I know most of you reading this will probably think I'm just a normal person making this story up to scare you. I was counting on that. You probably wouldn't believe me if I told you that there are many like me living among you. To those of you that are like me, please let me know if you have had a similarly frustrating experience. Besides the very obvious mistake I already mentioned, what can I do differently next time? If you have any advice or know anything else I did wrong, please tell me. I just want to find a nice life and be happy like everyone else. Why does it have to be this difficult? Thanks for watching. Please comment, like, share and subscribe. The Internet Surfer on YouTube for more horror and scary stories.